it comes the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest stand best for a world of lost sinners was slain So despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So chapter 6. We got you all confused on the order of service. We're going to sing at the end of the service, and we're going to do that a little differently throughout this series as we kind of point our attention uh, to a great truth in the Bible that should be an encouragement, should be an inspiration to us. Uh, and then as we learn about that truth at the end of the service, we're going to stand and sing a number of songs. And I just hope that it will kind of maybe shake things up in our, in our worship. Uh, maybe shake things up in our own heart and mind as we can see uh, songs that we've sang about the cross, things that we've known before, but just kind of see them in a fresh light uh, in a new way. And so uh, you're, if, you're, if you're coming in, you're not late, but just things are going different. So in Galatians chapter 6, the Bible says in verse 14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. In this new series entitled Why, when just don't do it doesn't keep you motivated, I want to give you five reasons to continue to run your Christian race. A lot of times when you know, you're a kid, mom would say, well, you know, go out and get that out of the car. Why? You know, and, and they go, just do it because I told you, because I'm dad. Uh, you know, I'm kind of guilty of that, of parenting in that way. But I'm so thankful for the Bible. It's not just a bunch of rules that just do it. But in fact, the Bible gives great motivation and re there's a command, yes, but then the Bible is really good at kind of coming back around and saying, this is why we want to do it. Uh, every time you see the word therefore, uh, it's, it's usually because there's a command given uh, or some truth that's been given and it says because of that, now we want to do this. The why is always uh, given in the scripture. And so I want to point our attention to this one this morning and that is the cross of Christ. Paul says, God forbid that I should glory in anything except for the cross of Christ. I want you to see, first of all, the glory problem that we have in the book of Galatians. The church at Galatia was a church started by Paul. 
He went there preaching nothing but the gospel of Christ and the foolishness of preaching and the foolishness of the cross. Preach people are saved, baptized to follow Christ and to declare their decision of salvation in Christ. A church is started. Paul leaves to go start other churches. And then he writes back to them in the book of Galatia because there's something going on. There's a problem in the church that Paul started. And the problem is, is these people, there were false teachers that came in behind Paul and they added to what Jesus did on the cross. They were, they were saying, look, uh, that's good that you uh, want to be saved, that your faith is in Christ, but you also need to do this and this and this. Specifically, they were kind of caught up in this issue of circumcision. It was something that the, that the Jews definitely did to signify their uh, uniqueness. Uh, to uh, in the relationship with Jehovah God, but understanding uh, that Jesus Christ came to fulfill all the law. And so these people are a little confused. The false teachers are in there purposely uh, looking at trying to get people to conform outwardly uh, and to do things outwardly. They're not concerned about the new person inside or that there be a change inside. They just want the outward conformity of religion so that they can fit in, so that they can uh, glory in the flesh, so that they can say, man, look what I did. Look who I got to be a convert. They want the glory uh, or the, the focus on the outside of the flesh so that they don't have to go through the persecution uh, of the cross. And, and they kind of distance themselves from that because to be a believer in Jesus, to follow the cross of Christ, meant definite persecution for these believers in the early church. You see in verse uh, 11, it says, you see how large of a letter I've written unto you with my own hand. Paul didn't normally write his letters. He Probably a scribe did that for him, uh, and he'd sign his name to it. But here, I, I think there, there's a lot of debate on this, but you just imagine Paul's like, hey, I really want to get this point down. I'm writing this in big letters so that you understand. That's what some people think about it, or that he wrote the whole thing. But, you know, six chapters, or the, the book of Galatians isn't really a long letter. Uh, and so some people maybe think he has some physical malady, maybe with his hands or with his eyesight, and he's writing bigger so that he can... He can see it, uh, and this is an important task that he wants to be uh, the one to convey this. But either way, he says in verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. He goes, look, these are the guys, their glory problem is they want to make a show of the flesh. Just like the Pharisees and the, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the people that are now teaching you, the people that are pulling you away from the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, they're all about the flesh. They're all about putting on a show. They just want to be accepted by mankind. There's no reliance or desire for the truth. He goes on to say, uh, they constrain you uh, to be circumcised, only lest they should uh, suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. And so look, they don't, they, they don't want to be connected with people who are going to be persecuted by the Jews or persecuted by the Romans. And so they're trying to get them to conform and they're adding to what Jesus Christ did on the cross and say, hey, this has got to be done too in order for us to have right standing with God and for us to receive salvation. Uh, the motive for this is wrong. Their glorying is so that they can, people will be impressed with them and the work they're doing as far as converting these people back into some kind of Judaism. Uh, the motivation is in part because they're afraid of the cost of the cross. The price that will be paid if their faith is in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. And so in verse 13, he says, For neither they themselves who are circumcised, they don't keep the law. You understand that nobody can keep the law. You know, the law, the Ten Commandments wasn't given so that you go, Oh, I got it covered. I'm good to go. I made it. I arrived. No, the Ten Commandments is an impossible list. It's, a, it's really just an outline of the rest of the law, and there's just no way that any of us could keep it all to be perfect in every way, shape, or form. That was sort of the point of the law, was to realize, man, I'm, I'm in trouble. I can't do this. I fail. I trip over myself. I'm born a sinner. I desire sin. I am prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. <clears throat> and the law was to point us to the Messiah, the Savior, who would come and save us from our sin, from our wickedness, and from our inability to be perfect before God. He says, but these people desire in the middle of verse 13 to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Their motivation was to escape persecution. Uh, their motivation was to be able to write back home to Jerusalem and say, hey, look what we did. We got these people to convert. We got these people to follow us. <clears throat> Excuse me, in our religion, and our way of doing things. 
there was a problem with their glory and that it was resting in the works of their flesh. They boasted in their religious accomplishments and their faith was in those things instead of in Jesus. Their, their, their reason for running was not in, in Christ, but in their religion. Their self-worth and confidence and arrival status derived from this man-made list of rules similar uh, to today where a person might get the idea that because they're they're, they're, that they are a part of an elite or special uh, group of people because they're part of some certain denomination or some subset uh, of that denomination or because they uh, graduated from a certain college or lived by a certain standards uh, that somehow uh, because they're, they're a personal accomplishment, they're more connected to Christ, they're more loved by Christ, they're more accepted by Christ uh, and they're kind of glory in that fact and the, the dangerous thing is, and even in, in making biblical standards in our life and deciding to make decisions that are based on the truth of God's word to live our life a certain way, is that we would begin to revel in that and think, man, I'm somebody because I've got this list. I've got this thing I do, this way I do it. I am awesome. You are not. <laughs> We're better than them because of this. And, and, and that's what was happening by these false teachers uh, in Galatia. Uh, and Paul writes to them and say, look, you've got a glory problem. I, I'm afraid sometimes that people, maybe members of our church, that we might get the attitude sometimes, that, man, I love my church. And I, I'm thankful for that attitude. But it can turn into this. It's like, well, they, they go to that church and we go to City Light. You know, like we're, as like somehow we're something we're somebody because our church sign is orange, even though it's, it's white until Easter. And we're going to, anyways, you know, like, and we're just like, well, we're better. We've arrived. We do it this way. I, I certainly know the reverse is true. Man, starting a church and trying to follow the Holy Spirit and, and, and go the way that God wants you to do and not get caught up in some of these kind of traditions. Uh, I've lost some friends over it. Man, I've, I've heard some sermons against our church and the things that we do. And, man, we would never, you know, what kind of church serves donuts? You know, and they preach on that for a while. And, man, they think they're somebody because they don't uh, have baked goods in the lobby. I, where does that come from? You know, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, it comes from the flesh. It comes away off focus, off of Christ and the things that don't matter. Things that don't concern Jesus. It didn't concern the Apostle Paul. He writes and says, hey, we've got, a, we've got a glory problem. These people aren't even doing what they're telling these other people to do. These false teachers come in and say, hey, you should do this, you should do this. And they're not even keeping it. And Paul points that out to them. You know, it can be tiresome to run in our own wisdom, in our own way, in our own strength. In our, and we add all these things to the gospel. And that can be wearisome. It, it can be enough sometimes to frustrate you and make you want to quit and give up because there's something that's inherently missing when we get off in the weeds, focus on things that aren't coming from uh, the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus wasn't saying, hey, let's sit around and do nothing. He's like, hey, there's work to do. I'm headed somewhere. I'm going to accomplish something, but hook up with me because my burden that I'm trying to get you to carry, it's easy and it's light and you're together with me and I'm going to strengthen you and I'm going to help us get there and I'm going to pull the way. I just want you to come along with me on the ride. And the Pharisees didn't like that. The Judaizers didn't appreciate that. In fact, they're the ones that yelled crucify and to put on the cross because he wanted people to stop glorying in the accomplishments of their flesh and rest 100% on the finished work of Christ that he was getting ready uh, to finish when he died, buried, and rose again. I wonder this morning if we have a glory problem. Is the boast in your life in anything other than the cross? Paul said, I'm not going to glory in anything save the cross of, the Christ, of Christ. When we ask the question, why? Why keep running? 
Someone could say, just do it. It's the right thing to do. It's what Christians do. We, don't, we go all the time. Jesus is coming back. Just keep going. But I think Paul offers this motivation, the cross, the cross of Christ. You know, when we glory in our money and glory in our successfulness according to the world's standards, you understand what happens when that disappears. Man, when it's about our job and the kind of job that I have and I'm so smart because of the education and this thing and, I, I am so, and that's what our life is all about and we kind of puff our chest out, what happens when you lose your job? You lose the wind that used to drive you, that used to get you up in the morning. Here's the great thing about it, though, is that the cross still remains. When we make it about our personal holiness and our standard is higher than their standard, there's a different, we're better because of that. What happens when you fail? Your standard, not God. Well, man, it kind of, it kind of sucks the wind out of the sail. It kind of makes you get frustrated, makes you upset, makes you maybe even think about Quitting, what's the point? It's so frustrating. And that's because we're, we, we get off track of running the race that Christ has set for us. And we've now made our own thing and our own works. And, or maybe we're following after another guy and his things. Or the, the people, that the false teachers that come in to the church of Galatia. And we're after them. And then it kind of falls apart. And we get disenchanted with all that Jesus is doing. And it's not really Jesus fault at all. It's because of some man-made thing that we've allowed in our life or placed there ourselves, And it just causes us to quit. Some people that looked outside this morning and saw the snow rain and thought, that's it. I'm done. You know, like, this is like April. Jesus, you know, I, this is too big of a cross for me to bear. I'm not, I'm not going outside. And you might have come in here this morning, honestly, thinking, this is my last service. This is my last day. This is it. I'm not doing this anymore. Look, I get it that sometimes we get tired. I get it that sometimes we get weak in our own flesh. I get it that sometimes uh, all the things that happen in this world in our life, and we want to maybe even turn on and blame God. But one of the things that helped Paul to keep going, one of the things that he continued to point people back to was this thing about the cross and glorying in the cross. But in order to do that, we must first stop glorying in our own self and our own accomplishments we can be thankful we can be glad but we must realize that anything we've ever done is simply because of the cross had there been no cross there would be no civilization there would be no humans there would just uh, god would say man adam uh, eve you messed up that's it i'm done but even before adam and eve there was a plan for the cross there was a display of God's love. There was a way to remedy the wickedness and sinfulness of mankind to the glory of God. If you run in your flesh, you will fail and most likely not finish. We'll ask, why? Why am I doing this? What's the point? That's what happens when we glory in our flesh. But you know, if we run in our flesh, we'll faint. Like when the Bible says in Romans 5, 6, for when we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. You understand that we never had the strength. We never had the ability. We never had the power to run and do what Christ did. To be what God intended for us to be. And that's why Jesus died for us. That's why the cross is there. Because we faint. Uh, if we run in our flesh, we'll run in circles. Um, Psalm 127 says this, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain to build it. Man, look at me, I'm impressive. Look at me, I did this. Look at me, I can do this. Look at me, I'm better than them. And if it's not centered on Jesus Christ, he says, you're labor in vain. What are you running for? So everybody looks at me. Great, there you go. What's the point of that? There really is no eternal purpose, Psalm 127, verse 1. When we run in our flesh, we will fail and not be successful. But the Bible says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And sometimes we look at our days, we look at our weeks, we look at our challenges. And we have to be honest with ourselves. We think we're something. We rely on our experience. We trust and glory in our bank account. We, we revel in our plan that it's superior to someone else's plan. When Paul's saying, listen, the glory should be in the cross, the cross of Christ. When we run in the flesh, we 
will act foolishly. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, comparing themselves among themselves, they were not wise. It's foolish. You gotta look around, we sit in church and go, at least I'm not that guy. You know, that only works until the next guy walks in, he's better than you. And then you go, oh, and then you're, you know, then you're discouraged. You're like, you're like, oh, I can never be that. I can never do that. It's not about what you can do. It's about getting our focus on the cross of Christ. And if we keep it there, we recognize that nobody deserves forgiveness. Nobody deserves a second chance. Nobody really can do anything of value save the cross. And that's why Paul gloried in it. We see number two, the glory proper. And that's where Paul says in verse 14, God forbid that I should glory. Save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Forget all the other stuff. If I'm going to get a big head about something, if I'm going to thump my chest and hold uh, my head up high, it's not because I'm a Jew. It's not because of my circumcision. It's not because I was baptized. It's not because I've been through catechism. Uh, I'm going to glory in the cross. I'm going to glory in Jesus He alone is awesome. He is everything. When I was without God and without hope in the world, Christ died for me. Amen. Amen. I'm glad three of us agree with that. (laughs) Christ died for me. Paul, for Paul, the cross of Christ was the symbol of his only significant accomplishment. I was a sinner. And Jesus Christ came got in my way on the road to Damascus and I put my faith in him. And you may look at me and think I'm impressive. There may be something I've accomplished in this flesh that may be worthy of, uh, of someone putting me in the paper. He goes, but the fact of the matter is the things that were gained to me, I count them loss for the cause of Christ. For the cross of Christ. We think I'm impressive because of my bank account. I'm in because of my education or my vocation or my standard or my lack of a standard or my lack of a bank account or my big home or my small home. Like someone's like, well, I, I would never live in a house like that because that is just so ungodly to be tied up in this world. Like you see, it's not just about having a bunch. You can have a little and have the same prideful attitude that glories in yourself and your ability to endure pain or hardness as opposed to the grace that God gives that allows us to endure the difficulty uh, and the hardness. You know, you might do something that's impressive to someone else, but possessions and popularity fade away. So wrapping my significance in a material possession or the attention of other human beings is quite ludicrous. I really want to cover my whole existence in one thing, Paul says, and that's the cross. I want to wrap everything in my life in the fact that I was a sinner, didn't deserve a Savior, but God loved me and died for me so that I uh, could have eternal life, so that I could be right with Him. All that I have is the cross, the cross on which Jesus died for me. You know, we wear a cross and display the cross in our home, in the, in the, in the church. Uh, people were worried about when we took the cross uh, out of the baptistry and cover, covered it up. And they're like, what, what's going on around here? Are we, uh, you know, are we going liberal? Are we, you know, like, hey, like, it's like, no. In fact, it's in the closet. If you want it, you can take it home with you. Uh, it's still in the closet. If anybody's still, you know, if you want a seven-foot cross that weighs 300 pounds, be my guest. Uh, uh, it's, it's all yours. But here, here's the thing. Uh, Paul, when he's, like, we think, yeah, cross. Like, let's display it. What's wrong? We don't have crosses. But in, in Paul's day, for him to stand up or to write a letter and say, hey, guys, I know you're getting tied up with all this stuff from Judaism. I know you're getting tied up with all these works of the flesh, like tithing on every little thing and being at church and making these big prayers. And you think you're somebody because of all these religious things you do. Paul writes, says, listen, I'm just glorying in the cross. For him to say that, he was the, probably the first person to ever say that. It was an absolute scandal. This morning, if I came in and said to you, I glory in the noose. If I took you to my house for lunch and all throughout my house I was decorated with nooses hanging from the ceiling, framed on the wall, you would think, the guy's creepy. <laughs> He's infatuated with death. Maybe even race. You know, just, and, and there were all these kind of weird, that's, that's the context in which Paul says, I'm glorying in the cross. I glory in an instrument of death. 
Uh, I glory in the instrument chosen by the Romans, uh, sovereignly by God, though, uh, to, to punish sinners. To punish those, they, the outcasts who break the law, those rebels of society. For the Romans, it was a sign of weakness. For the Romans, it was a sign of shame. For the Jews, it was a sign of oppression and dominance that they wanted to overthrow. And rather than run from it, rather than hate it, rather than spit on it, Paul says, I glory in it because of what it did for him, what it does for us. On the cross, Jesus bled and died. On the cross, the holy wrath of the Almighty God was poured out uh, on Jesus for my sins. Instead of me hanging there, it was Jesus who took my place. Instead of me going to hell, Jesus experienced my hell for me. He became sin for us. He that knew no sin so that we could be made right with God. The, The cross is the only thing that gives me significance and value. Listen, without it, I'm just a creature in line for judgment. Without the cross of Jesus Christ, I'm just one of the billions of people who have lived on this planet disconnected from my original purpose that I was created for, and that was to walk and to worship with God. One songwriter said that I boast not of works, nor tell of good deeds, For not have I, not have I done to merit his grace. All glory and praise shall rest upon him, so willing to die in my place. The chorus goes like this. I will glory in the cross, in the cross, lest his suffering all be in vain. And I'll weep no more for the cross that he bore. I will glory in the cross. My trophies and crowns. My robe stained with sin was all that I had to lay at his feet, unworthy to feast from his table of life till God made provision for me. I will glory, I will glory in the cross, lest his suffering all be in vain. I will weep no more for that cross that he bore, but I will glory in the cross. Glory, yes. But not in me. Who am I? In the cross. That that is every bit of my significance in my life is because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. The cross motivates me to run the race because it is the symbol of life's only true purpose. Folks, sometimes we get caught up in our jobs. Sometimes we get caught up in in like, you know, hey, I want to, I want to, Go to all 50 states. I want to see this. I want to be there. Man, I I just got to get to Hawaii. Look, when you get to heaven, you won't care about Hawaii. I'm just telling you that right now. You're like, "Eh, Hawaii, you know. Uh, And and if you've been there, it's, I'm not, you know, I know we have some some people in this church who've been to Hawaii, and that's fine. I'm just saying, go to Hawaii, but don't glory in that. It's in Jesus Christ. Don't live your life trying to check off something that this world has to offer because it's meaningless uh, and pointless. Don't look down your nose at somebody like you've arrived somewhere and they're lesser of a life form because of some decision that they've made or some standard that they have uh, because without the cross, you wouldn't even care about who Jesus was. You wouldn't desire to live after God. But the cross motivates me to run because it gives my life purpose. It motivates me to run because it symbolizes all that Jesus endured uh, for me so that I could be made right with God. You know, we look at the cross like that's what it took. Jesus being tortured, his beard being plucked out, the crown of thorns on his head, lashed with the cat of nine tails, nailed to a cross and hang there to drip blood flow out. That's what it took to cover my sin. That's what it took to cover your sin. Uh, Without hope, and somehow we think that, man, if I do this and this, then God will be impressed. I'll get into heaven. No. It's the cross. Somehow we think, man, if I do this and I do it this way, different than those people, that God will be, woo, you're somebody. But no, even then, it's like, even as a Christian, even when we know our our sins are forgiven only by Christ, We can so quickly and so easily glory uh, in our own accomplishments. 
When I glory in the cross, it motivates me to run because Jesus' death isn't the only death that occurred on the cross that day. The Bible tells us of three deaths, which is point number three if you're writing the notes there in the outline. It says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I to the world. It's kind of an interesting verse, isn't it? So Paul says this, look guys, let's not get caught up in this glory problem. It's not about anything we can do. We can't do it. But it is the proper place for the glory is in the cross and what Jesus did when he accomplished it. Then he points our attention to two additional deaths that took place on the cross, at least in the life of the Apostle Paul, and I believe it should and does and can in our life as well. He says this, first of all, obviously Jesus died. He died for the sins of the whole world. But he says, secondly, what happened is the world died to me, and I died to the world. That's a kind of an interesting thing for Paul to say. What exactly does he mean here? What exactly does that mean? Uh, and, and this is what it means. The first part there, the, the world is crucified unto me. It's the idea that the, what the world has to offer, it just doesn't do it for me anymore. The, the cross kills the world. It, it makes it seem second rate. It, it makes what the world has seen to offer temporary because it is. Uh, it looks like a cheap imitation of the real thing because it is. It has no permanence and no substance because the world is dead to me. It no longer has power. It no longer has pull or priority in me, on me, or over me. Because the world is dead to me. Look, I am living for a different thing. The, the men and women of faith in the end of the book of Hebrews they said they, if they'd have been mindful of the place they come, they could have returned, but they desired a better country. That is a heavenly country whose builder and maker was God. The world and what they had to offer and what they were selling to get people's focus off of God and to stop running the race that was set before them. They said, I want something better than that. And so the things that the world had to offer were dead to them. The cross has put me in a different dimension, John MacArthur says. I am transformed. And the world claws at me with all of its might, but in vain, because it's dead to me. When I am tempted to stop running my race, when I'm tempted to quit, it's because, my friend, we're resurrecting the earth's significance in our life. I must get back uh, to the cross, for it is the cross of Christ. In the cross of Christ, the world is dead to me. When I, when I can remember uh, that, we, uh, I, I know I've already said this, but you know, there'll be times in our life where we come in and we're just like tempted, like this is it, this is the last day, this is the last straw. Someone said that to me, offended me, and, and, so, and, and we get way bent out of shape where this place uh, and walking with Jesus and reading our Bible used to excite us and used to thrill us and used to energize us, and we've gotten off either Jesus did something wrong, which really isn't an option, or somewhere I'm focused on something else. And what Paul is saying, and what I'm contending with this morning, is that we've got to get our focus back on the cross. What Jesus did for us, and what he made possible. When I consider the cross, Paul says, the world, the world dies to me. The pool, its temptations, its frustrations, its bigness in my life, is no longer there. He also says that I die to the world. I die to the world. What does that mean? Well, Galatians 2.20 has some similar language. I believe Paul's already told us what it means, but he's just reminding us again in Galatians 6 when he says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it's not me, it's actually Christ that lives in me. So he says, look, uh, when Jesus died on the cross, the world died to me as well. It's no, it's no significance to me. I'm living for something better than that. He goes, but I also died to the world because he goes, well, I didn't really die. Like, I'm still here. I still have a heartbeat, but it's Christ living in me. It's Christ who is guiding my life. It is Christ who is making the decisions through his word. I've yielded it to him and the control of the Holy Spirit. It's like, it's like going to get your oil changed uh, and going, I don't want to tell him about church. I don't want to invite him. He may make fun of me. And the Holy Spirit says, this isn't your life. Do what I tell you to do. 
And you go, all right, the world's dead to me. And, and I'm dead to the world. I'm not living here anymore. This is really Jesus' life to be lived through me. And so what do I do? Well, the last part of that verse says, now I live in the flesh, but I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. And so by faith, I obey. By faith, I trust. By faith, I follow the word of God. I follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in my life because on the cross, Jesus died for me, yes. But the world also died in that it pales when I truly uh, wrap my mind in truth in the eternal things from the word of God. This world dies to me very quickly. The other thing that happens is I die to the world because I'm not living. I know it sounds really weird to say this, but I'm not living here anymore. <laughs> yeah. I'm taking a back seat to Jesus, his word, and the Holy Spirit making the decisions. The cross is the only trophy that I can raise, but I do it humbly because it was Jesus' condescension. It was Jesus' substitution. It was Jesus' crucifixion. It was Jesus' resurrection. It was Jesus' ascension that won the day. I simply accepted the gift procured by him. You ever seen an award show where Someone comes and like, uh, you know, they won the, everybody's clapping. Someone walks on the stage like, who's that guy? He's like, oh, I'm just here today to receive this award. Uh, you know, so-and-so, I apologize, you couldn't be here. And I'm just here to, to take it. It's sort of like, that's sort of the kind of the way this happens, where all the glory, all the praise, he did it all. You know, I just get the privilege of coming up in it. I get to accept the, accept the award. I get some of the benefit uh, of it, uh, but I had nothing really to do with it. Uh, we praise the Lord uh, that God provides that for us. The cross is the only trophy that I can hold high, that I can glory in, but I do it humbly. We denigrate the work of Christ by attempting to add our own righteousness to it. We cheapen the gift of the cross by thinking somehow it's enhanced by me. When I was five years old, my dad was a pastor in downtown St. Louis. We had this skinny little church like all the other buildings in the downtown there on Jefferson Avenue. Uh, and as, uh, as a five-year-old, I remember going into uh, my dad's office or maybe just his bedroom somewhere, uh, and he had been working on this picture he had drawn with a pencil. It was a picture of the church building, the inside of the church building, from the perspective of standing at the back doors there just before the auditorium and kind of drawing the pews and drawing the choir loft and little chairs that were up there and different things that were there. And it was just really intriguing to look at and go, oh, like, I remember saying, oh, that's our, yeah, that's our church. And I remember Dad saying something sort of like, yeah, there, we're done. I'm done, I'm finished. And he put it down. I look at it, I'm like, Dad, there's a, there's a clock right there. And he goes, no, no, Matt. He goes, there's no clock there. I said, yeah, there's a clock right there on the wall. Like, and I'm pointing to this up here. Like, like what preacher in his right mind would put a clock up there? You know, no, no preacher ever. But in my five-year-old mind, I was convinced there was a clock up there. And my dad said, no, there's not. He goes, we're not going to put one. Just, it's done. And he put it down, and he went go do something or grab a bite to eat. I don't remember exactly what he did. But when he left the room, you know what I did? I finished it for him. I helped him out, you know. I picked up his beautiful work of art, and I drew with the precision of a five-year-old. Uh, I drew a circle with a 12, you know, and a one, and a two, and the hands. Uh, and, I remember, and I remember my dad coming back in the room, you know, and I had the pencil in my hand. He's like, what are you doing? And I, well, Dad, I'm just, you know, I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to help you. I wanted to fix it. You know, imagine my embarrassment the next Sunday when we went to church, and I walked in. And my dad reminded me that there was no clock at the front of the church. Sort of felt kind of silly as a five-year-old, thinking that I was going to correct him or add to what the work of art that he had created. You know, my friend, that's the same thing that we do when we glory in us. When we, in pride, think that we're better than someone. We don't want to deal with somebody because they're a hassle or a headache or an inconvenience or they mess up our schedule. It's sort of like we're glorying like I'm somebody to be worshipped. I'm, I'm the reason this is awesome. Like we've forgotten that it's because of the cross. It's because of what Jesus <coughs> 
did for me, if there's any value, if there's any goodness, if there's any redeeming quality, it wasn't put there by me. It was graciously given by God. In Galatians 6, 15, he says, For in Christ Jesus, it's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, but it's a new creature. Circumcision doesn't avail, he tells the Galatians. And he's like, oh, see, I told you, I told you. And he goes, yeah, but uncircumcision doesn't avail either. I told you, I told you. Like, wait. He's like, here's the deal. What really matters in this is there's a new creature. What really matters is that there's been a, a, that you were spiritually dead, but you're made alive when you put your faith in Christ alone. Circumcision ain't going to do that for you. Uncircumcision isn't going to do that for you. This religion isn't going to do that. That religion, coming to church every week is a good thing, but that's not where it's at. Giving, tithing, whatever other thing you can, you can say, that is not our redeeming quality. Paul says what it is, is, is the cross of Christ. My friend, if you're here today trying to figure it out, figure life out, trying to search for God or meaning or purpose, the greatest one I could, the only one I can point you to is the cross of Christ. You're not going to find purpose and meaning and significance in following a list of religious rules. And that's what Paul has written back to the church of Galatia to, to warn them about, to remind them uh, about. You began in Jesus Christ. You began in the Spirit. Why have you jumped rails and over here working in the flesh now? It's not about that. My friend, today, if you're here without Christ, you don't need to do a bunch of things. That doesn't avail. That doesn't work. What you need to do is become a new creature, a new person. It's got to be a change that takes place, and that takes place when Jesus Christ comes into your life. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and all things have become new. You need what the Bible says is salvation or to be saved. For the Christian, this morning you're here and you, we know that Jesus saved us. We know it's not a work of our own flesh, our own might. But isn't it true how quickly we can think that we're somebody because we're on the same team? You know, like, like no, you're on the bench. You're like fourth string. You're like no, like, no significance. It's all about the star player. It's all about Jesus and what he's done for us. Here the cross says I'm guilty. The cross says I deserve to die. The cross says I couldn't save myself. The cross says the penalty was really bad. I know that doesn't sound great theologically, but it's the truth in that it took a cross to forgive your sins. The cross says, though, that I'm loved, that I'm forgiven. The cross reminds me that I have a cross too. The cross reminds me that I, there's a death that happens in my life too. I die to the world and the world dies to me. The cross reminds me that there is a race to run. And the cross reminds me that I can win the race. Maybe today you're running in your own strength. And you're just about done running. Just about want to quit and throw in the towel. Could I just encourage you to not quit? But instead of just the most morning to say, hey, just keep running. It'll be okay. It'll turn out. You know, just do it. I really want to point you to the cross of Christ. For you to see what Jesus endured. For you to see what Jesus did because he loves you. For you to see and remember that it's, if you're getting tired running in your own flesh, your own worthiness, it's because you're not worthy. And we glory. We can glory in the cross. The songwriter said, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gains I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? His dying crimson, like a robe, spread o'er his body on the tree. Then am I dead to all the globe, and all the globe to me. 
were the whole realm of nature mine. That were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. The cross of Christ is the first of five motivations I want to give to you to continue to run. Not to try to put wind in your own sail. Not to kind of do it in your own strength or your own ability, your own goodness. Because we don't have any. Anything that we do get, it comes from the cross. Where Jesus died for us and was buried and rose again. All the work of the cross is what should energize the run that we do for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads.